As moshing was embraced by growing masses of metalheads, it began to eclipse the previous metal rite of headbanging. I'm just glad people are done banging their heads. Yeah, dude, the headbanging thing is kind of like the whole... <laughs> oh, yeah, moshing totally replaced headbanging. Oceans of people in the early 80s, like, just simply going, yeah, metal, metal, metal. That's gone, and it's replaced with these kids like, metal, metal, ah, and like bumping into each other. Before long, thanks to shows like MTV's Headbangers Ball, a whole nation of rowdy young fans got turned on to the new scene. I first started seeing slam dancing. It was Santa at the Headbangers Ball. Santa Claus, the man, the myth, the slam dancer. <laughs> Do you remember he would be in the pit? Yeah. Kind of like scooting around in there? We had a giant mosh pit in our Indians video in 1987. Old right. anthrax videos and stuff, and guys with mullets and, and jerseys and uh, denim jackets just dancing around in a circle. Those videos set a standard. When those people came to our shows, they wanted to live that video every time. I remember there was a video for Exodus, this band called Exodus that had a song called The Toxic Waltz. No, the toxic walls. Don't want to do the toxic walls. Slam your partner against the wall. And they just had this ginormous pit. I saw a Megadeth video for, what was it, uh, Wake Up Dead? Wednesday. The big dudes are crawling around in the cage. Yeah. And they had, a, they had like an eight-guy mosh pit, and they were basically just jogging in a circle. But I thought that was pretty rad. Pretty soon, mosh consciousness spread beyond metal videos. Long before rappers like Snoop Dogg were spitting rhymes at crowds of body surfers at Lollapalooza shows, hip hoppers had found common ground with metalheads in a number of iconic music videos. Slam, yeah, that was that dope. video. That went off. They would go crazy. That was ill. Matter of fact, they wanted the black rock and rollers a hip hop <laughs> to me. They, the hardcore gutting is like monster close to the the heavy metal. I think I, I seen it start off really with Onyx, man. In 1991, Anthrax teamed up with Public Enemy for an early rap metal foray on P.E.'s Bring the Noise. We did Bring the Noise together, and they would all come out, and we would do the song together, and that's when the whole place would just go nuts. And that's when you would see people in the pit, and you know those dudes are in the pit for the first time ever. I can remember it at Lollapalooza, and I saw like maybe the most wicked pit of my life. At the start of the 90s, moshing was pretty much limited to various underground music scenes, but that was about to change. In 1991, Jane's Addiction frontman Perry Farrell started the Lollapalooza Festival. Here we Harry Farrell sure had a genius idea uh, to put together this package tour of bands and to really make a large bet um, on the hope that there was a huge audience out there of kids who wanted to rock but who were really bored with the spandex metal that was everywhere at the time. Perry Farrell was going to put together a tour that had the kind of bands that covered a huge spectrum. It was, you know, that was exciting. <laughs> Seven different bands, and they're like every different kind of style. It's really intense. Lollapalooza 91 brought with it both alternative sounds and body language. Lollapalooza, I'd say, was like when it was like when it came big to the people, like moshing. The first time I remember seeing it on a huge scale like that was going to one of the Lollapalooza concerts and just realizing that it was completely insane. I guess it's when it became kind of um just the thing to do at a concert. That was the first time, I think, for a lot of people to come there and see that and go, wow, you know, this is what goes on at these alternative rock concerts. That first Lollapalooza tour introduced moshing to the concert masses, but the real nationwide mosh explosion was sparked that same year by a now classic grunge rock video. It became big in the mainstream. People weren't really doing it at our shows. When Nirvana and all that came out big, then I guess is when it came back at our shows. It seemed to me that, that Lollapalooza made Nevermind inevitable. With, you know, the rise of bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden, that's when MTV grabbed a hold of it, and Nirvana made the video for Teen Spirit. Yeah. 
And then all of a sudden, Nirvana became huge, and that video was played all the time. What happened was it made it, you had to mosh. All of a sudden, you know, you had 10 million people buying that record, and now you had 10 million people wanting to experience that. When kids started seeing the Nevermind video or the Even Flow video or going to Lollapalooza, that was their reality all of a sudden. That was it. It was as if music didn't exist 20 years ago. Ongoing Lollapalooza tours offered an interbreeding ground for all kinds of musical styles and moshing for the first time as a signature activity for all different kinds of fans. What do you guys think of Lollapalooza? Yeah! I want everybody to meet each other and know each other, you know, like a big body of musicians that all know each other. Only good things can come of it. Lollapalooza crossbred rap and rock and even injected white punk moshing into the hip-hop concert scene. Ready to peel your cap, you can't believe Ice is a death bone wax. Somehow when uh, I guess the first hip-hop group was put on stage at Lollapalooza, that right there, that particular time helped to open people's minds. Back, 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 back of the neighborhood. I can remember it at Lollapalooza. I saw like maybe the most wicked pit of my life. I don't think, you know, you could have possibly had a more culturally, sexually, musically, like, diverse thing happening there. And to me, that was, that was actually really cool and really powerful. Lollapalooza also popularized stage diving and crowd surfing, forging a new connection between bands and their fans. One, two, three, <laughs> crowd surfing is your sort of moment in the spotlight and really just wanting to get closer to the band. You're not in a band, you know what I mean? You're not like the star of the show, but in a way, you can be the star of the show. Yeah. We come from a scene where, you know, if you're a member of the crowd, you're probably going to end up on the stage at some point during the night. You know, if not, you at least have the same mentality. Or the band's going to come down in the pit with you. Yeah. Yeah. As moshing started to dilute the focus of a show, the stars up on stage started angling to reclaim the spotlight. The pit was the show, not the band. And I come from uh, an era and, uh, where the band is the show. I don't want the pit to be the show, unless I'm in the pit. The band started body surfing and, and, and slam dancing, and it was like the band's kind of on top of the audience, not the audience on top of each other anymore. There was a shift with Eddie Vedder and Kurt Cobain. Jumping into the crowd and getting passed around almost made you appear to be some sort of Christ-like figure, even down to the, the way they'd spread their arms and just roll their eyes back. I remember like this kind of like messianic feel that Chris Cornell had, where he could just lay his hands out and do the Jesus Christ pose and be carried like across the sea of people. Moshing was not about that. It was about losing yourself in the crowd. And here, it was about elevating yourself literally over the crowd. It wasn't all men up there, of course. No one understood the art of getting attention better than a woman called Courtney Love. I hate this place. Courtney Love would jump off the stage into the crowd, and her dress, already being somewhat frayed, would get more torn up. Courtney's a very savvy woman about, uh, you know, rock archetypes, and she understands that if you do jump in the crowd, that's it, kind of like the ultimate expression of, of, you know, bonding with your audience. It's an extremely intimate experience that she found out the hard way, and she eventually stopped because she was getting groped. Pretty soon, everybody was moshing, even one-time teen pop princess Debbie Gibson, who took the plunge one strange night with hardcore pioneers, the Circle Jerks. We have a special guest who's going to sing this next number with us, and her name is uh, Debbie Gibson. By this point, of course, people were starting to wonder out loud how cool moshing could actually be. We publicly take a stand against moshing. Oh, man, when that dude from Pearl Jam dove out of the balcony, I was like, it's over. <laughs> when these shows first started, the people who were moshing were kind of like involved in the punk scene and the alternative scene. And as time went on and things became more popular, then you started to get the guys who were just kind of the lunkhead frat boys who thought, hey, this is cool, I'm going to go check out the show. When alternative was the mainstream, and part of that alternative was like mosh pits and everything which became the mainstream then it was everywhere the roots of it are genuine the manufacture of it and the commercialization of it is, is, is a little less genuine when it's in miller light beer commercials you know it's time is gone <laughs> yeah! imagine the ad agency a bunch of these 
jerk off sitting around with suits going, washing's hip. That really shows you to the extreme of where it's gone. It's typical of what goes on. Anything that's good is discovered by corporate America, exploited, and dissolved until it's dead. And when you see it in the new Offspring video, you know it's time is gone. When you see like people crowd surfing to Sheryl Crow or Joe Cocker, come on. I couldn't believe that they were moshing for the spin doctor. The softest song will get the, the hardest reactions. Dude, when I come around. <laughs> <laughs> And then, the death knell perhaps, people went from moshing to unlikely music Everything's heavy to moshing to no music at all. Not doing this running in circles. Hey, the music hasn't started yet. Yes. Lollapalooza kids are starting to like mosh in between bands to like just like background music. We can take a break and they'll slam it. It's really <laughs> they they want to get up music before the show. Yeah. Maybe it's time to stop all this and look for something new. In the wake of of this most recent Woodstock, it's not possible to see a mosh pit or to see a crowd behaving that violently and not feel kind of creeped out and nervous about it.